welcome. We welcome you to this morning's service. But not only do we welcome you, but all of us together welcome the Spirit of God into this place, amen? And so we welcome God with our minds, we welcome God with our hearts and with our mouths, but this morning we're gonna also welcome God with our bodies. So I will ask you all to rise, please. The first song is Welcome. And so you're just gonna stretch your arms out. And then we, to this place. Welcome. And then we're broken, we come broken with stuff. So you're gonna make a broken gesture, we're broken. To this broken vessel. You desire to abide in the praises of your people. Excellent. So we lift our arms as we lift our hearts as we offer up this praise unto your name. Amen. to God's name. For this God calls us. He calls our whole selves, our hearts, our minds, our bodies into this place. And our God calls our whole selves, our feats and our failures, our shouts of praise and adoration, and our cries for help. So with the psalmist, we hear and we offer these words that call us into confession, into praise, 
into worship. Join me in this litany from Psalm 51. O Lord, open my lips. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. chosen not to see you, God, in the face of the other. We have not seen your image in the refugee, in the prisoner, in the man on the corner with a cardboard sign. From the people you call us to see, we have turned away, looking instead to those who look just like us. We confess our blindness our callousness, and our fear. Come, teach our souls to love your truth. by hatred, by fire, and by flood. To the people you call us to hear, we have turned a deaf ear, listening instead to those who promise us an easy life. We confess our deafness, our laziness, and our fear. Come, teach our souls to love your truth. From the people you call us to love, we have closed ourselves off, loving instead what is safe, what is known, what is comfortable. We confess our coldness, our prejudice, and our fear. Come, teach our souls to love your truth. Oh, 
With open hearts, hear these words from Psalm 85 that assure us of God's forgiveness and of his peace. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. And when the Lord speaks his peace to us, it sounds like this, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God has given us his peace. I invite you to turn to your neighbor and with the words, the peace of Christ be with you, extend that peace to one another. continue to worship this morning, um, our Christian community is global, and here at Calvin College and here at the Worship Symposium, people come from all over the world, from different languages and different cultures, um, and so as we enter into a time of praise, we'd like to acknowledge that by singing the phrase, praise the Lord, in five different languages. Um, so if you'll repeat after me, we'll do a little practice. So first in Japanese, shu-o, shu-o, tata e yo. And in Dutch, loaf de hair. Loaf de hair. And in Swahili, buana. Buana. Asi fiwe. Asi fiwe. And finally, in English, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So let's practice that together. <laughs> attention, you might have noticed that I promised you five, and I only gave you four. Um, so another language that we love to value and acknowledge is American Sign Language and Deaf Culture. Um, so over the top of all these languages, we're going to add ASL. So to praise, uh, it's like clapping your hands, like this. And then Lord, if you make an L shape with your hand, and you're going to move it from your shoulder to your hip for Lord. So praise the Lord. So let's try that all together.
Let us go before our God in prayer. The sounds of many voices in many languages lifting up praise to you, Father, brings us joy. This is the sound of the people of God. We have heard languages unfamiliar to our ears, and we have heard languages of our communities. For the church, the in all times and in all places church, is made up of these little communities. You have given us all little corners of the world to love and to cherish, in which to seek shalom and flourishing. We love our corners as worship leaders and sound technicians, as dancers and as preachers, as Sunday school teachers and coffee makers. And sometimes the work of loving our corners can be wearisome. We are weary of having the same conversation over and over again about musical preferences when we know worship is about so much more. We are weary of not having ready solutions when the way we worship or the way our building is laid out or the assumptions we make hinder people from worshiping with us. We are weary of navigating the murky waters of politics and competing definitions of shalom within our communities. And we are weary of spending so much time and energy and effort in our work and not feeling like it's making any difference in the lives of those we serve. So God, we ask that you would help us love our corners. When faced with tedious conversations, give us the patience and the words to shape those conversations well. When we are stumped by the challenges before us, give us creativity. When we become bogged down in details and logistics, give us the capacity to step back and see the big picture. When the voices in the room grow loud and angry, give us the courage to sit in silence and listen for you. And when we are discouraged and empty and it seems our work doesn't matter, remind us that you are the Lord of the church. You are working in the hearts and lives of your people whether we think we're being effective or not. The fate of your church does not rest in our hands. So open our eyes to see you at work in our communities. Open our ears to hear your voice. Open our hearts to receive your love, that we might love you and the corners of your world in which you have placed us. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Remember this portion of the story of God as it is written in the book that we love from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter. Thomas, also known as Didymus. Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee. The, the sons, sons of Zebedee. Zebedee. And two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going out to fish. And they said, we'll, we'll go, go with you. you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, <gasps> they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? They answered, no. no. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
because of the large number of fish. Uh, the men the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he threw on his outer garment, for he had taken it, out for, taken it off for work, and jumped into the water. <laughs> the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from shore. About a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with burning coals and fish on it. And some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. There's 100 here. Fish so Simon there. Peter went back out to the boat and pulled the net ashore. It was full of large fish. 147. 153. <laughs> <laughs> but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came. Took the bread and gave it to them. And did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon Peter was hurt, because this was now the third time Jesus asked him, do you love me? And he answered him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you, and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said, follow me. Then Simon Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, a rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? 
This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who broke them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things. If every one of them were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Wow. Let's let that marinate just for a little bit, absorb that. Wow. Good morning. morning. Allow me to express my gratitude to the phenomenal team working behind the scenes of both the Center for Excellence in Preaching and the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. I just love this symposium. And I hope that you will also join me in extending our sincere gratitude to these phenomenal musicians from Calvin College. (laughs) To these amazing ministers to the liturgical movement ministry of dance. and to this phenomenal team from the Northwestern College, the Scripture Arts Team. Wow. (laughs) Now let me hasten to the task at hand. Will you pray with me? God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to you, our God, and true to our native lands. Amen. This prayer was written by James Weldon Johnson as the third stanza of a recitation recited by 500 school children on the occasion of a visit by Booker T. Washington to the then segregated Stanton School in Jacksonville, Florida in 1900. Johnson, like many other African-American poets, hymnists, lyricists, and librettists, embodied the cries to God for help, healing, and hope within the creative, divinely inspired songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. This recitation was eventually set to music by James's brother, John Rosamond Johnson, and was adopted by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People as the Negro National Anthem, lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on to victory is won. For many, lift every voice and sing is an an attractive aspiration. Yet increasingly, 
more experience the dim and dark reality of the weary years and silent tears rather than the ringing harmonies of liberty. In our homiletic passage that was so well done this morning, we don't necessarily find weary years, but we do find the disciples seated with the master after a number of extremely long and weary days filled with some not so silent tears. After a night of unsuccessful fishing, you saw it here, Jesus reveals himself to seven of the disciples, blessing them with a huge catch and then inviting them to dine on the beach to a charcoal fire. Ever the redeemer, ever the reconciler, Jesus leans over to a rather traumatized Peter, who I imagine is still challenged by his own anxiety, guilt, and shame of his nefarious conduct just days ago. You see, the last time we saw Peter, he abruptly dismembered Malchus's ear. He denied knowing Jesus three times. And according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he ran off weeping bitterly. Even at the sight of the marvelous discovery of the miraculously empty tomb, Peter reappears, but then rather than remaining there with Martha and Mary, he runs home like a coward and even locks the door. Peter is paralyzed with grief, shame, and embarrassment, with an absolute sense of humiliation, and yet Jesus summons him face to face for a post-meal intimate conversation. In order to get at the depth of this intriguing interaction, we must ask the question that the great mystic Howard Thurman asked quite often, who is this Jesus? Who is this divinely inseminated human being born to unwed parents? Who is this prophesied fully divine, fully human progeny born in the favela, the tortoise, the slum, the saramu, the barrio, the Biddenville, the hood of Nazareth? In the region of Galilee, a Jewish enclave that was overpopulated, destitute, and extremely poor, that by contemporary American needs vernacular, Nazareth would be in the same categorization as Africa, Haiti, and, well, you know the rest of that. <laughs> who is this young carpenter who preached compassion over compromise, forgiveness over fear, love over division? Who is this holy once refugee who got indignant when he saw children mishandled, misled, and abused as pawns for adult political pandering? Who is this Christ who listened and loved those who cried me too and thought enough about black lives? to have Simon the Serene participate in the crucifixion narrative by carrying Jesus' cross. Who is this learned rabbi who hung out with lepers, conversed with at least one Samaritan woman, and spoke to the wind and the water as if they were people? Who is this life-giving light of the world who fed thousands at a time, healed the sick, and even raised the dead? Who is this Jesus? Jesus was neither zealot, neither Pharisee, neither Sadducee, neither Essene. Jesus was neither authoritarian, neither political overseer, neither elected Jewish leader. Jesus was the one who was prophesied to come and to bring the good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, to give liberty to the oppressed, and to forgive our debts. Jesus rejected the allure of institutional power, for he did not find that his power came from the law. But he taught, shared, and was empowered by the Spirit. In fact, Jesus was not compelled to be an advocate of law and order, but an exemplar of mercy and justice. Who is this Jesus? Jesus, 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 who is 
this Jesus. It was Jesus who not only cleaned up Peter's mess by healing the ear of Malchus, but who was about to blow Peter's mind with three not so simple questions. Imagine with me the interaction of one who was a mumbling, stumbling, fumbling disciple walking on the beach with the good shepherd. Imagine with me the fear and trepidation of the one who had not only denied knowing the Son of Man, but who also abandoned his post, deserted his calling, but now is being summoned to take an intimate stroll on the beach, one on one. The tension in this scene is so thick you can cut it with your finger. Peter had been agonizing in shame with guilt and fear for days, not realizing that the one whose trust he betrayed would summon him for a walk. Peter's heart was so heavy that every time he got ready to apologize or fall prostrate on the ground, before God incarnate, he froze, falling steps behind Jesus' gentle pace. Peter was messed up, y'all. He, he was scared. He, he was angry. He, he was embarrassed. He was fearful. He was disoriented. He was befuddled. Peter was increasingly becoming unhinged. And then it happened. Jesus called him by his birth name. Simon, son of John. Reminding him of who Peter was before he had been asked to leave everything and to follow Christ. Repositioning him in his unregenerated state. Jesus calls him by the name that he went by when Jesus first met him. Jesus forces Peter in his ever so clever way to remember his life before his transformation, to remember his life before his salvation and his consecration. Jesus, already up inside of Peter's mental space, calls out, Simon, son of God, do you love me more than these? Trembling and petrified, Peter responds, yeah, yes, Lord. You, you know I love you. In this first of three not-so-simple questions, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than any of the other disciples with an unconditional, radical, selfless love in the most pure and highest manner imaginable? Peter responds, Yes, Lord, I, you know I love you with all the affection that I have. I, I'm extremely fond of you. <laughs> I, I love you as a companion, as a sibling. Jesus' response was even more perplexing than the question, since Peter was inherently awaiting some form of reprimand or a reminder of his past failures, yet in the moment, Jesus instructs him to share that love with my young, with my tender, with my impressionable. Share that love that you have for me with those who are new in the faith, those who have been evangelized and now need to be discipled. Feed my lambs. Peter, anxious about what could possibly happen next. And then he hears Jesus call his name once again. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, Jesus uses that agape form of love. And Peter, in his human frailty, yet with all humility, responds with a declaration of phileo, to which Jesus commissions him to shepherd those in the faith who are strong and mature and yet still need some direction. 
tend my sheep. Worried, annoyed, and somewhat infuriated. Peter hoping that the conversation might quickly come to an end so he can go off and process. <laughs> Heard the sound of the Messiah's voice for the third time. This time with a different inflection, with a different timbre, with a different tonality. Jesus says, do you really have affection and fondness for me? Do you, do you really love me as a companion, as a sibling? As one who had just made confession and felt affirmed and heard, Peter, still broken, still weak, still humbled and afraid, says, Lord, you know everything. You, you know that I don't have the capacity to love you the way that you have always loved me. You know that as much as I want to believe that I do, and as much as I confess that I do, my understanding of how much you really love me continues to be beyond my very being and certainly beyond my imagination. Lord, I've learned that all I can do is to do my best to be honest with you and to share my limitations, even my limited ability to love you the way that you love me. As Peter was in the middle of his next statement, Jesus says, Now! Now you are ready to not only tend my sheep, but to feed them. Feed them! The good news as I have fed you. Feed them the fruit of the Spirit as I have fed you. Feed them all the teachings that I have fed you. Feed them in a way where they will know that you will give your very life that they might live. Feed them as I have fed you. Follow me. In that moment, Peter is commissioned to the pastoral role of under-shepherd of Christ's bride, the church. Peter is reinstated and with the aid of remembrance and confession is forgiven. And just like you and just like me, Peter is distracted by a momentary tweet. <laughs> by a glimpse of a post on Facebook by a cleverly captioned image on Instagram, in the midst of the transformation, in the midst of the work that God is doing through Peter, Peter is distracted. Peter looks and sees John over his shoulder and begins to inquire about a breaking news tweet, <laughs> revealing a rumor that John would live forever. Jesus quickly claps back and says, follow me. <laughs> See, maybe you have had an experience where Jesus asked you a question or two or three that you know you were not fully able to answer in a way that you would like. Maybe. Jesus has called you to a ministry that you might not feel fully equipped to lead. Maybe Jesus is calling you out of your broken past and you really, really, really don't want to come out of it yet. Maybe Jesus is trying to restore you, revive you, rejuvenate you, recommission you, and, and you feel like you're not ready yet. Maybe Jesus has a particular peculiar assignment for you and you really don't want it because it seems that you will be alone and in solitude. Maybe Jesus wants to know if you really love him, really, really, really love him. Maybe Jesus has asked you to feed his lambs, to tend his sheep, and to even feed his sheep. If so, let the words of Jesus to John be the words of Jesus to you.
Keep your eyes fixed on me and follow me. Hear Jesus say, where I go, you go. Follow me. Where I send you, you go. Follow me. Believe in me. Trust in me. Have faith in me. Follow me. When I call you, come. Follow me. Stay in my presence even when I'm not physically there. Follow me. Follow me into deeper relationship. Follow me. Follow me and teach my lambs and my sheep to lift every voice and sing. Follow me. Follow me and hear the harmonies of liberty ring. Follow me. Follow me and rejoice high as the listening skies and loud as the rolling seas. Follow me. Follow me and let the faith teach you. Follow me. Follow me and let the hope lead you. Follow me. Follow me and let a new day begin. Follow me. Follow me and let us march on to victory. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Hear Jesus say, follow me. sermon, Follow Me, so eloquently preached by Dr. Price is one in a form of a prayer. So I will ask you all to stand, please. And the words are, take, oh take me as I am. So we just lift up the arms. The next is, summon out what I should be. And that's the prayer. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Thank you. 
May the love of God be with you. May the passion of Christ be with you. And may the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you.